All right. Well, thank you, everyone. I apologize for the big entrance here. I'm a victim of the um, sequester. My plane was late leaving LA, and then we circled for a while, and you know all that thing. It is it is lack of agility. That is the fundamental problem that we have. <laughs> So here's a proposal about how we spend some time together, which is, first of all, that we, we have some fun here. So Agile can and should be fun. It often isn't fun. If I'm reading the looks on your faces right, many of you know that. You've experienced the quote unquote Agile death marches, which don't make a lot of sense, but they happen a lot. And maybe we could spend some time talking about the sort of cultures that lend themselves to effective Agile implementation. Now, having just said that, I we use the word implementation and effective, and it was the same sentence, and it was long, and it had a lot of words, and it probably had commas in it. So I think the only way to recover from such a thing is probably to show you a movie clip, just to get things started. I hope that's okay. So here's the point, okay, keeping in mind that Agile should be fun. I'm gonna make a series of proposals tonight about what people, about what leaders in Agile can and should do. And I think we're a little hot on the mic, is that true? Yes. I think we're getting a little bit of feedback. Yeah, thank you. So um, again, people in the, in the Agile world often tell me that, that it, how do I say this? It was designed to be fun, and it should be fun, and it can be fun, but it often isn't fun. And so for us to have a non-fun discussion about making Agile fun just seems silly. And so rather than do that, let's try to have a bit of fun with it. So to get things started off here, I want to show you a movie clip. You may recognize where this is from, and if you do, please don't say, and I think we need to boost the audio. Yeah, the, there we go. If you recognize which movie this is from, please don't shout it out. But as we're watching the my question is, why did so many people want to see this movie? The eyes of the world now look into space. Godspeed, John Glenn. The eagle has landed. Space, the final frontier. Right. Of course, recognize this is the old Star Trek. This is not the one that J.J. Abrams is about to come out with. But so let me start with the question that I asked you to look at. You know, the transporter sound just appearing into the background, fading into nothing. Why did so many people want to see this movie when most people who were in the target market knew the storyline? The hope of the universe. Okay, it's the hope of the universe, he says with a smile on his face, right? What else? Yes, please. All those cultural ties to the Neil Armstrong thing. Right, so ties to the Neil Armstrong thing. We heard the familiar voices in the background. And that's a, actually a, a very good lead-in. So the hope, so there's something about, we just kind of focus on the word hope. There's an aspect of it that's forward-looking, but to do hope well, don't worry, this is not an Obama rally, okay? But to do hope well, <laughs> you also have to look back and connect what is to come with what has already come. And they did that effectively. Are there other reasons that people wanted to see the movie? Yeah. The Star Trek subculture, right? It's culty, and we wanted to see what J.J. Abrams was going to do with it. Why else did people want to see this movie? Yes, sir? It's a story that we've seen before. I want to see how they change it. I want to learn more about it. I'm curious. Which, you know, begs the question. First of all, it is a fake story, right? <laughs> we don't live in the 23rd century. Despite what some people at Agile conferences wish, there is no Starfleet Academy for us to go to. I, if, if I'm disappointing you, I deeply apologize. But it's a fake story. So people are actually willing to pay money to see details filled in to a story that is fake. Just on the surface, that makes absolutely no sense. Now we get the idea that there's a subculture and it's connecting to the John Glenn thing and it's the hope of humanity. Why else did people see the movie? Yes? You know, maybe to see stuff that was done, stuff that they liked from the past, but kind of taken with a modern angle or a modern approach or something like that. Could be. Right, the updating of it, right? The modernization of it. We want to see that. Any other reasons that come to mind? We relate to some of the characters and what it, uh, you know, live it out and project while we're watching the movie. Yeah. 
Makes sense. And everybody loves a good story. How many of you in the room paid money either directly, you swiped your credit card to go see it or you paid cash, or you paid in the form of having HBO or on demand? How many of you paid to see the movie? Okay, so for those of you that just raised your hand, same question. Why did you pay? Two hours or however. Every time some Star Trek has been on since I was five, yeah. I've enjoyed myself for that period of time. So you might be thinking, okay, let's move on. What does this have to do with it? And yet I keep asking you the question, how come people ask, or how, how come people pay to see this movie when they do the storyline? So then here's my question, maybe going to your mind, directed to me, and I'm going to direct it back to you. What does this have to do with Agile? Is there any possible connection? Exploration of the unknown. Okay, exploration of the unknown. It could be. They learn by doing. They learn by doing? What else? It's a new iteration. It's a new iteration. Um, right, it's a new release. And, <laughs> and we're gonna we're gonna do retrospective out, which kind of we're doing now, right? So we could look at it, we could evaluate it, we could test it. Any any other possible connections that this has to Agile? Okay, now you're, you're mixing universes, but yeah, Obi-Wan Kenobi's the, uh, right, he, he knows that. He's enough of a geek that he, that he knows it. So here's the point that I'd like to make, just a, a couple things about this, about this little video clip. First of all, just to connect it to some data from tribal leadership, this is probably the headline number, only 7% of cultures, and let me define a culture here just so we know what we're talking about. Yes? Yeah, I was gonna define tribes in the context of culture, so let me jump to step number two. A tribe is a, so I don't mean to be cute with it. It's not a cute word. I don't mean to imply we're going to do rituals or things like that. That's not what a tribe means. In, if you look up the word in the dictionary, the etymology is Latin. So I'm not referring to any particular tradition. All I mean operationally is the following. A naturally occurring group between 20 and 150 people in size. Between 20 and 150. Now, if you think about it, most teams are smaller than 20. So then why would we be interested in tribes? I mean, that's you know, one, one question. And what does that have to do with cultures? And how does all, all of that connect to, to Agile? So I don't think anybody will disagree with the following, but let me throw it out as a hypothesis and see if anybody does. A team is, the, the performance of a team is largely determined by the environment of the larger organization. In other words, an Agile team at IBM is going to be very different than an Agile team at Cisco. And I happen to think a lot of both of those companies, but they're different. So the context is dominant. So why are we talking about a tribe? So there's something interesting about a group of 20. Okay, we've got more than that in, in the room. If, we were, if this group were to continue, so if we were to be given a project of some kind, there would be a way that we talk in here. And if a new person came in, we would teach that person, implicitly and explicitly, here's how we do things. And this would be a stable form of discussion. Now, there's only one thing that would interrupt that stability. And I, I mean, other than maybe changing out a whole bunch of people. That is if someone of significant political rank or someone that we thought a lot of came in here. So if Brad Pitt, just to pick a name, walked in, you may not like Brad Pitt, but he's got a celebrity about him, and so you, a person like that, if introduced into the, into the tribe, would create a big change. Short of the celebrity factor, short of the President of the United States walking in, we have a certain way that we communicate, and it tends to be relatively fixed. Now here's what's so interesting, just to show you the insanity of companies. What people have tried to do, and I'm talking about executives, for many years, is they grade performers within the tribe. So you're kind of A's, and you're kind of B's in the center, and over here, if you're in a blue shirt, sorry, you're a C. So every year, and I'm referring explicitly now to what IBM and GE and some other places have done, every year, the C's have to go. And if you measure the distribution of performance a year later, after you have reposted positions, here's what happens. The tail has regrown. Why? Because when new people come in, we teach them how we do things around here. One definition of culture is how we do things around here. The definition of culture that we use in tribal leadership is how people describe themselves, their work, and each other. 
So we're measuring language, the words people use to describe themselves, their work, and each other, and related to that, who they say it to. So one person standing alone talking to the vending machine is going to be far different from us having a conversation. And I'm saying if you parse all that down, the unit of analysis here is tribes, not teams, not companies, but tribes. So only 7% of them are up to the level of doing Agile really well. So let me just kind of pause here. Comments, questions? Yeah. yeah question. Why not limit it to you know, groups of, say, 20 to 100? Why can't you have a tribe that's 1,000? So the answer is um, we don't know. I mean, we, we literally don't know why there appears to be that number of 150. So let me just give you a little bit of background on that number. It was popularized by Malcolm Gladwell in the book Tipping Point. And there's a whole chapter in there on the power of 150. Robin Dunbar is the person that did a lot of the work. But even before Dunbar's work, that number, 150, it's one of those weird numbers that keeps showing up again and again in history. The Romans would keep track of what was the size of a fighting force and essentially whether they won or lost. And when it was 175 as the fighting force that would go in, more often than not, they would lose. Now, I'll tell you things that tend to happen. More than 150 fragments. More than 150 turns into a political creature. You tend to have naturally occurring dissenters and splinter groups and so on. There tends to be a main culture and a counterculture. That tends to not happen if you've got below the 150 mark. So the 20 is the introduction of stability. Above 150, it becomes a bit unwieldy and it begins to fragment. Okay? So then here's the point in the time that we have left is we want to make sure that your tribes, the tribes that you are a part of that are doing Agile, are fun, don't turn into death marches, and are members of the 7%, not members of the 93%. That's the goal here. And again, being interactive, comments, questions, thoughts, no ways, how about, you got to be kidding, I'm in the wrong place. Yes, sir. How do we get to 7%? So that number was published in the book Tribal Leadership, and here's what it's based on. I'm going to show you what the levels are. What we call stage four accounts for about 20, I'm going to give you some math here, so sorry if this gets dense, but I want to answer your question. 22% of tribes are at the level, we call it, we're great and you're not, and it's got certain characteristics that I'll show you, so 22%. Only 5% of tribes are stable at that stage. So here's one way to think of it. If you look at a sports team and they lose, look at them in the locker room after. The vast majority are going to be down in the dumps. A few will do retros, right? We'll look back, we'll look for lessons learned to try to get their game up for the next time that they're right, going to go on the court or on the football field. So only 5% of tribes are stable at what we call stage four. There is a fifth stage, which is the top and only 2% of tribes at any one point are at that stage. Five plus two is seven, that's where that number comes from. So they're stable you know, at that level, not easily set back. Did I answer your question? Well, I mean, I would just ask again, like, how did you get those numbers? But... Okay. <laughs> um, I love that question because, uh, so one of the roles that I have in, in the world is I'm a college professor, have been for many years. So we collected data for about eight and a half years, 24,716, I believe, data points. We began to tease out in research what are naturally occurring tribes, which is a bitch to figure out, right? Who's talking to whom? What are the natural groups? Today, with a lot of network analysis, some of this is, is automated. We were doing a lot of this in the old days where we'd pull out a sheet of paper and say, who do you talk to at work? If you've got a company of 10,000 or 100,000 people, who do you talk to? and then try to tease out what your relationships are with them and have other people do that and match it. Now, to be clear, we did not do that for 24,716 people. We had a variety of methods. So first of all, we, we figured out that this thing called the tribe that no one had ever, as far as I know, written of before, something bigger than a team, smaller than a department, different than an organization, certainly smaller than most, that that is the basic force in any human endeavor. That was we think a new insight. And then secondly, to measure where those are on this one to five scale is something that nobody had ever done before. And we use a variety of methods to do it. We use surveys, we used observations, we recorded meetings, we did transcripts, we did a whole bunch of things. And later on, we actually kind of refined it, and I'll show you some of the things we did. We would have people go out and measure groups on our behalf and report back. 
and just to test to see whether they were doing it right, we would then go in and test it. What is called the inner rater reliability was about 0.9, which means this is actually something that you, you, know, you could go figure out with a pretty high degree of certainty. Did I answer your question? I love smart people because you ask questions like that. That's better than, I don't know, we made it up, right? Okay, so then just to, you know, again, having, having a bit of fun. What Agile requires to do it well, and I'm, you're gonna think that I'm messing with you or, or that I didn't think a lot of you on the plane flight, flight here, but it is your job to become a prophet. Now, let's be clear. I'm not saying start a religion. I'm not saying start a cult, okay? And just to get the tongue-in-cheek nature, anybody get the reference here of the picture? The love guru. It's the love guru. Okay, so very much tongue-in-cheek. Now, if you think about what a prophet is in the, in the non-religious sense, it actually goes back to the clip that I showed you with Star Trek. So why did so many people want to go see it? Well, you mentioned John Glenn. So it looks back, so the work of a prophet is to look back, see what the trends are, the themes are, the values, and here's the key, project forward with a degree of certainty. What happened before gives us the clue about where we're going. And we must go there because it is who we are. So here's the foundational piece of this whole thing. In order to do Agile well, you need to be a, a, a leader of the culture, a cultural architect, you might say. Someone that's gonna set up the culture in a certain way. Because context is decisive. And if you don't do this, then here's what's gonna happen. Your tribes are gonna naturally drift into the 93% that don't do well and then about the only tools we have to get people to do things are the old you know, carrot and stick and we beat people or we bribe them into doing things and it turns into a miserable experience for everyone. So I mean this tongue in cheek, but the message behind it is actually a very serious one. Please. Uh, maybe we'll get to this later, but you talked about uh, being an architect of culture. Earlier when you talked about tribes, you were saying tribes tend to be very stable in their culture unless something yes. sort of completely out of left field comes in. How does that, how does, how does a cultural architect exist if yeah. the culture is stable and relatively unchanging? Again, I, I really enjoy working with, with agile groups because you ask questions like that. They are, they do tend to be fixed. By fixed, I don't mean unchangeable, but I do mean hard to change. And why that's actually good is if we can find a way to re-engineer the culture, it will tend to, if you will, stay fixed. Now that's really different than a team. If you've got a team of five people and you're having a bad day, go to happy hour, your mood will improve, your morale will go up, and the next day it will tank. The teams are like this, but tribes have a certain stability to them. That's something that we can harness. Did I answer your question? Yes, please. Don't they kill prophets? They do kill prophets, which is why I wanted to show you a prophet who didn't die. I actually didn't see the movie. It got such bad reviews that I, I didn't go see it. So if he got killed at the end of the movie, I don't, I don't know that. So then what this message comes down to is really four points. Okay, and it comes down to this. How do you do this? How do you become a prophet? So the, the meta message here is you want to, again, re-engineer your tribes to get them into the 7%. The very first thing that you have to do is prophets speak the language of shared values. So now we got to just get rid of a couple things here right off the start. So if you go into most companies anywhere in the world, there is a list of values. I am not referring to that. In fact, if you really want to re-engineer your cultures to do Agile well, then take a, you know, a lighter and burn that sucker down. That list of values, in most cases, it has absolutely no relevance to what anybody does. And I'll just give you a quick story on that. I, I was in a company and I was you know, telling them, same as I'm saying to you, profits have to go in and figure out what people value. They tease it forward. They discover what people value. They do not declare values. So they tease it out. And this person came up to me at a break. This was in maybe a three-day session. He said, look, I don't know what to do. I'm from HR. And I said, why is that a problem? He said, look at this training guy that they want me to deliver. And it was essentially me as the trainer coming in and telling all of you, wagging my finger at you, here is what you value. What complete and utter nonsense. So if I go up to someone, like if I, if I say to Dan, who's been my friend for many years, Dan, you're not a very respectful guy. You need to be more respectful. Is that going to in any way change his behavior? Yeah, it's the opposite. Exactly. 
and, I'm, and I was picking on Dan because I was hoping that he would say that, it in fact does influence behavior in the opposite direction. If you say, I think we should, we should become respectful, somebody in the group will say, damn right, I think we should be respectful right now. I'm going to go pee and get up and like make a commotion as they get up. And then, Notice they're demonstrating a lack of respect. What they're saying to the whole process is, this is bullshit. So what is it this guy, and I'm talking about, uh, about George Washington, actually did? When you get beyond the myths and the rhetoric and the stories, the truth about Washington is actually interesting. People have puzzled over what made this guy an effective leader, so much so that there's actually a theory that's floating around, that the only real advantage that he had was height. He was six feet tall. Because there wasn't really that much about him that was remarkable. He wasn't a good speaker. He had fake teeth. They were wooden. They smelled bad. So he had bad breath, a speech impediment. He was not particularly smart compared to the Madisons, the Jeffersons of the day. So it wasn't intellect. It wasn't his reading. He actually wasn't that well read. And it might say, well, maybe he was the most ethical guy in the world. Actually, not even close. So there was a book that was published about 15 years ago called Washington's Expense Account. So when he agreed to be president or king, they didn't quite know what it was, he, he declined a salary. He said, I will only work for expenses. And he charged everything as an expense. And people looked to see what would have been the difference if they actually would have paid him a salary. And he got paid something like, depending on the estimate, 30% more or 130% of his salary. It was just an incredible difference. So what is it that made him unique? Well, I actually want to argue it was all of those things that gave him an advantage. So he was the member, going back to what is a tribe, the wealthy landowners in Virginia, that was a tribe, naturally occurring group. Members of the militia, that was a group. The Continental Congress, that was a group or a tribe. So what did he do? He went in and he listened because he had fake teeth, a speech impediment, and he was constantly being afraid that someone was going to reveal the fact that he wasn't the smartest guy in the room. And so when people said, Jefferson said to him, what do you think, Washington? And he said, and this is a paraphrase, but they're actual quotes that come pretty close, it seems like we all want the same thing, freedom and independence. OK, so what was the value of that? No pun intended to the word value. That got the attention of people in the day because most people were talking about what they thought what they believed. So just to give you one example, again, getting beyond the myths and the rhetoric, Franklin was off partying in Paris with the brothels and things like that. And then actually got his attention when this guy Washington began speaking this way. It was different than how most people talked. So you mentioned in the Star Trek clip, well, it's taking us back to Neil Armstrong. Right. So here's my question. Please don't cite any founding documents. That's not what this is about. What are the values of Agile? What are its versions of freedom and independence? And I mean that non-rhetorically. What are they? When Agile works, what are the guiding principles that make it function? Individuals okay, and interactions over processes and tools. That's interesting. Somebody said something really insightful, and then Dan blurted something out really loud. No, that's very good. Yeah, it goes and, back to 2001. It goes back to 2001. And, yes. And cost effectiveness. What else are the values? And I'm just kidding. Yeah, of I course. Like, yes, please. Software. Very good. What else? Trust. What is it? Trust. Absolutely. What else? Yeah. Failing fast, working empirically. Very good. Failing fast, working empirically. What else? Visibility. Trust. Sorry? Visibility. Visibility. Good. What else? Collaboration. Collaboration. So now you might ask, well, what's the point of going around and saying, hey, we love collaboration? We love empirical stuff. We, we love to fail faster. We love cost effectiveness. What possibly does that have to do with anything? I want to tell you a quick story. Again, I live in LA, in Los Angeles. And I work a lot uh, with the LAPD SWAT team. I have them into the university classes that I teach, the people who do negotiation. And I go train them every year. And the FBI is there, and Homeland Security is there, and, and so on. And one day, I was with a group that was actually about this size. They were all sworn officers. So unlike New York. New York has a different model. If you're familiar with SWAT or you see it in the TV shows, New York uses a decentralized model. So the people who are hostage negotiators here, that's all they do. They're, they tend to be behavioral scientists. In LA, we have a centralized model. Everyone is everything. So you are a sworn officer if you're a member of SWAT. 
You might be negotiating one day. You might be looking at the scene through a sharpshooter um, scope the next. So in theory, anyone could do any job. Now, I'm not here to say one model is better than another. I'm not a member of law enforcement, not my field. Here's the point. I was with this group. Half of them were on duty, half of them weren't, and they still use pagers, better reception, as many of you know, than cell phones, and their pagers began going off. They had been deployed on a mission. So they got up, the ones who were on duty, they were dressed in kind of things that looked kind of like a combination between cop attire and uh, army fatigues, kind of a combination. And this very quick interaction happened. This one person turned to what was, who was clearly the senior officer, and he said, I don't think you're fit to deploy, sir. And the person immediately said, you're right, and he turned to someone else and said, you will be in command of the mission. And the person sat, the person who had had that exchange and was not deemed to be fit, sat back down. The whole thing happened that fast. And if you wouldn't have known it, if you wouldn't have known what was going on, it wouldn't have been remarkable. Now, here's the question. Who was in charge? It was not rank, because the person who said that followed it with sir. He was speaking to a superior officer. So who was in charge? Dan. The shared values weren't charged. Specifically, what shared value? Readiness. Readiness? Any other versions of that? Fitness for duty. Yeah, fitness for duty. Now, and just so you don't think that they're out partying or drinking martinis while they're going on duty, the guy had the flu. And you could tell he just wasn't well. He was sweaty, he was pale, he just, he just, he had the flu. The person recognized that. You're right, you're in charge, and he sat right back down. So notice, quick decision making, no drama, and all we're fundamentally talking about with shared values is a decision-making criteria or set of decision-making criteria. At the end of the day, that is all values are. It's not a reason to weep. It's not a reason to give people hugs and say, I love working with you. This is great. It's not a reason to do any of that. And most of the, of the things that people do to try to get this kind of values trigger are, again, complete and utter nonsense. The point is you want people making decisions in the same way. When they do, there's less drama, there's less conflict, we can do empirical stuff quickly, we can fail faster, doesn't really matter who's in charge. Yes, Dan. Also a very uh, interesting transfer or distribution of authority that occurred there. Say more about that. Well, you're right. this fellow had more authority apparently who was not ready. Yeah. And the one who had less authority said, it will all due respect, sir, yeah. right? You are not. Fit. Very right. good. So, so there, and then he said there was a formal transfer of authority. There was a formal transfer of authority. And the key is what made it function was the value. So if that shared value would not have been in the context of the decision making, then here's what would have happened. And you've probably seen this. Who the hell are you to tell me that? I'm the judge of who's fit. Excuse me. Do you, what rank are you? What rank am I? Let's see. I would be, am I more important? Oh, I'd be more important. Sit the hell down, you're off duty, I'm going to go deploy, followed by probably bad words. Right? That's how that would have been, at which point the person would have said, excuse me, sir, but the regulations say that blah, 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 and I believe that you are showing signs of not being well, and let's bring in a third party, let's bring in a mediator. The whole thing, best case, is it would have taken a couple minutes and it would have done damage to relationships. But in that environment, it is incredibly quick decision making. So the first thing, again, there are four, that profits do, and the goal of being a prophet, again, I'm being this tongue in cheek, is to re-engineer the environment in which you operate so that you can do agile well. And one of the things that profits do is to figure out what people value and talk in terms of it. That encourages other people to do the same. So comments or questions on this point? Yes, please. It's a scary game. I mean, I've been in situations where like, I've done stuff in my management company where I've done, but I would yeah. never be able to Yes. That would be normal. In most corporate environments, that would be stressful. You could say, well, I have the research, I have the analysis. You know, so you know, I could just present it on your behalf. Yeah. So let's break that down and, and look at what's happening. So in every environment, every environment, you've got hierarchy. So I'm writing a case study on Intuit. I don't mean this as a, as a I'm not saying they're a great company. When you do a case, you're just presenting facts. And what we saw in writing this case was a number of times Decisions were made, and the highest paid person in the room, in fact, in all cases that we looked at, highest paid person in the room at the point where the decision was made was not the person who made the decision. Okay, now in most 
environments, what I just said would be the opposite. The group will have a little discussion. That's good. That's fine. You, you go talk about it. I'm going to go refill my coffee because I'm important and you're not. And then I'm going to come back and I'll hear what you said. And then I'll, you know, take on the burden of leadership and I'll make the tough decisions because that's why I get paid the big bucks. And darn it, that's just what has to be done. And I'm saying from a cultural perspective, from an agile perspective, from a performance perspective, that's nonsense. So in the, in, in the case that you cited, there is a value that, is, that trumps hierarchy, and it's data or empiricism. So if you can prove it, that carries the day. But that's often hard to do. And sometimes we don't have data for stuff. And in a lot of cases, you then have to go measure something in some convoluted way to prove what doesn't even need to be proven in the first place. For example, with the LAPD officer, there was no need to prove that he was unfit. Everyone looked and came to the same conclusion. Does that make sense? So when you've got data or empiricism as a shared value, that's really insufficient for the kind of velocity that we need. Because then you have to prove everything. And what you're really saying is you've got to overcome the weight of hierarchy. Is that fair? Never be able to tell your manager that they're not really um, capable of handling a task that you need to handle it with. Well, well now, let's, let's be clear what happened in that case. The person was not saying you're incompetent. The person was saying you're not fit, and then the, the kind of unstated, which everyone knew, is you're not feeling well. Why don't you not deploy today? That's very different than you manage or an idiot. Yes, Robbie. Uh, in, in that situation, did they have a protocol for it the same way in Star Trek, that scene where they said by code 3052, you're not emotionally fit to leave this starship? Like, was, <laughs> it, was there kind of a protocol in place that they knew they were playing into? No. Really? So the, the best performing tr uh, tribes that we've ever seen, they do have the rules, they do have the regulations, the code 305.C7, the regulations, but what trumps them are the values. And people will occasionally get together and say, what are the values that we have? And what, is, what the hell do we think they mean? So we all value empiricism. We value cost effectiveness. We value failing faster. We, we, love, we value collaboration. OK, but what does that mean when we need to make quick decisions? Unless we figure out what that means and we all come to some kind of agreement on it, then they're just words. I'll give you a quick example. The word integrity often comes up as a value. Right? What does integrity mean? And a lot of people think, well, it means be a good person. And it actually can mean that. And to other people, it means I'm going to follow through on what I say I'm going to do. So I'm follow through. And so if I said, we're going to take a five minute break, everybody agree, and everybody agrees. And six minutes, somebody's not back, and then they come in. If you think that integrity means follow through, and the person's a minute late, they violated a core value of the group. But if the person thinks it means I'm a good person. I didn't kill anyone out there. I wasn't a serial killer. I didn't go through anyone's briefcase out there. Uh, integrity is on my side. So to your point, you've got to operationalize it. So a value by its nature is timeless. You are never in 100% compliance with it. I think we'd all agree with this. You never get there. So you have to come up with some ground rules about what these mean in operation. Otherwise, you're going to have the battles over definition, and that turns into the same thing. What is the fair value within the team as a conflict with the value of the company? So let's say yeah. the company wants you to do things as fast as possible, cutting corners, and the team wants to do things the right way, and then take the time to do proper testing and stuff like that. You, the key to all the values conflicts is you have to make it explicit. So as a group, we value, I think what you're saying is quality. We're going to do great yeah, we want to fail faster, we value empiricism, let's come up with a way to test it quickly. But we want to make sure it's a quality test. And the company says, no, 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 if we have to cut corners, it's all about efficiency. OK, here's what the tribe should do. We've got a perceived conflict. What the hell do we do about that? And have a discussion about it. Here's what you don't do. Pretend the conflict doesn't exist. Because then some people will side with one value, some people will side with another. Now, in the real world, and I really appreciate you know, how that's said, in the real world, there are irreconcilable values. Effectiveness and efficiency are two. So if I really value efficiency, then I want to get in and do 80% quality work, or 90%, and get out, right? 
But if I value effectiveness, I'm going to stay as long as I need to stay and do really good work. And if the team hasn't really agreed on that, the team is going to fracture. So you see, when you see this, it's, yeah, okay, we can all see the wisdom of that. That makes sense. You've probably seen that in books, and it makes a lot of sense. But we'll get into it. No, actually, you've got to dig really deep to figure out what the shared values of the group are, what they mean, how we operationalize them, how do we deal with conflicts, and what if the tribal value is different or irreconcilable with the company value. Now, there are ways to deal with it, but the key is you make it explicit. Does that at least give you something to go on? He's nodding. Yes. yes. So, question. All this assumes an existing team, which is often the, the case. What yeah. happens if you get the chance to build a new team from scratch? It's a new company, new engineering organization. Yeah. How do you determine what values to put in place and then how to find people matching that value set? That's actually a really good case. Then you can come together and say, let's look at our experiences from other teams we've been on. What's worked? What hasn't? So just to make, go ahead. Yeah. When, when we is me, there's like one person sitting in a room and they're trying to figure out who to hire, who to bring in. What do yeah. you do before there is a second person? Then you start with what are the values of that person. This happens all the time in startups. It's often a founder or two or three founders. And they want to scale to be 1,000 people, 5,000 people. So what do they do? You've got to start with your own values. And then you want to hire people who have the same value. So to be clear, you want diversity on every possible aspect of humanity, age, sexual orientation, diversity of background, you want engineers working with non-engineers, except values. You want homogeneity of values. Now, you will never get there 100% in the real world. So you've got to come up with some values that are the ones that you must have. And you're going to come up with some values that are going to create a tension in the group. Not everybody will agree. That's as good as it ever gets. OK? So remember, profits, re-engineering tribes, that's what we're here to do, get our tribes into the 93%. One thing that, that profits do is that they speak in terms of shared values. One guy who's not a prophet is this person. Again, having a little bit of fun, the public persona of Donald Trump is that he, sees, he says three words over and over, I, me, and my. So if you go back to the SWOT example, what made it impressive was the word I was uttered, but here's the question, who's the we? The we is the tribe, the naturally occurring group that comes up with what their values are. They will naturally say we. But there's one other thing, and this actually turns into a very specific protocol. If you look at someone who is leading hierarchically, here's what they'll do. This is called dyadic. So Gene here, I pronounce your name, your name right? So if I'm in charge, I come up to Gene and I say, hi, Gene, how's it going? And he says, um, fine, why are you ask me that? It's kind of a strange question. And I say, um, Hey, hey, Gene, there are six things that I need you to do. Because let's see, I'm the boss, and you're not the boss. It's this I'm great and you're not mentality. So you know, it's really nice that you've been hired here. This is a good company. You'll like it. But I need, you might want to pull out a sheet of paper, write these six down. And then I go to the next person. Sorry, what's your name? Oh, that's a tough one to pronounce. <laughs> what, one more time? <laughs> Ibanga. Ibanga? Yep. Ibanga. OK, great. That's a cool name. And so if I say to Ibanga the same thing, now Gene can't hear, really glad you're here, I need you to do these six things. Then I'm gonna come back in six months and I'm gonna tell Gene how he did. And I'm gonna tell Ibanga how he did. And if then someone from Human Resources comes in and says, wow, that's a very, that's a very icky process. See, it feels very command and control. Well, then we soften it. And I might ask Gene, why don't you evaluate me as a boss too? And while you're evaluating me as a boss, I'm going to pull out my, my email and check it, because it really doesn't make any difference. But it's a nice thing. And I got to check on the form. And then Ibanga is going to tell me how I did. I don't particularly care, because Ibanga is out of here in six months. We all know it. So notice the hub and spoke nature of this. So when you talk in terms of shared values, here is a consequence of that. You do not do dyads. Instead, in, instead, you do something that is very different, OK? So this is the second thing that profits do. The first thing profits do is talk in terms of shared values. Figure out what they are, talk in terms of them. Talk means incorporate them into every decision you make, from when to go to lunch to when you're going to do a test and how you're going to report on it, the whole thing. The second thing that profits do is they form what is called a triad, which is a three-person relationship. So if Gene comes in with a problem, 
instead of doing the I'm great, you're not thing and telling Gene what the answer is, I'll say, wait a minute, Ibanga, come on over here. And he comes over. Gene, you mind repeating that? Because Ibanga was telling me something the other day that could be really helpful. And Gene repeats it back, and I connect the two, and then I grab my, in this case, drink, right? And I turn around and I leave. I have just created what is called a triad. If you look at high-performing organizations, here's one of the things that you see in them that once you have the eyes to see it, you can't not see it, but before you couldn't see it to save your life. Someone has a problem, there's a quick interaction, often a third person is brought in, and the person who is perhaps the manager or the decision maker then leaves. So it's quick connections to other people. The basic building block of a, one of these 7% tribes is a three-person relationship. Now, watch how cool this makes us. So this is some of the fun stuff that you get to do if you've collected data on 24,000 people. So this is a tribe, okay? What do we see right here? I'm great and you're not, right? I'm doing the, I'm, I'm Gene's boss, I'm the boss here, I'm kind of telling people what to do. But if you notice right here, we've got a little bit of triading going on. This will tend to be a group that will make decisions together, collaboratively, on the fly, and based on values. This making sense? Now just notice this as a protocol, as a takeaway from tonight. This is the same group one month later. So the lines in red are the new lines, the new relationships. All that happened was one person came away from something like this, and they said it seems like the key is the tribe. Not the team, but the tribe. So we've got a team here, and we've got sort of a team here, and a team here, and a larger team here. So what Dave is saying is the tribe is really important, so let's look at the tribe. So here's the tribe. And we've really got a lot of these pockets, and it's not as wired up as it could be. Now remember, not everybody can wire up to everybody else. You hit the barrier of 150. But the person just began making a few more connections. You can actually measure the effectiveness of a tribe on, by looking at one number the number of stable triads within that group. The number of stable three-person relationships within that group. Making sense? Okay, so now we're gonna bring all this together and really get to the point. Profits create genius tribes. Now we're gonna have some fun with this as we go through. I've got three quick questions for you. So just to make this fun, we've only got, what, about 15 more minutes here. So what I'd like to ask you to do, we're not gonna form a tribe because that would be all of us. But we're just going to form little groups to get some data here that we can pull into a big discussion. So if you would, please just find a group of about three, four people. This will take about a minute. So find a little clump. It can be three people. It can be a row. So please find your, your little sub-tribe. OK? So we have a tribe. Sorry, a clump. We have a clump. Very good. good. Six is not, no, six is. You'll just have to be efficient. Okay, so I'm gonna ask you three questions. So here's the nature of all three questions. They're individual answers. Not asking you to come up with a clump answer. So please everybody just go through and answer it, probably in a sentence. When everybody in your clump is answered, please do this. This means I can go on to the next question. Someone in your group, if you've got a pen or an iPad or something, just jot down what people say. You do not need to write down who said it, just write down what some of the answers are. And if you don't have a computer or an iPad, just have a good memory. Okay? We clear on the rules here? So three questions, here's question number one. When people around you at work complain, what do they complain about? Individual answers, somebody write it down, thumbs up when you're done. Okay, question 
number two, this is a very different kind of question. What is one strength or skill that you have that's business related? What do you what is one thing you're good at doing? Please be specific. Okay, so that's I'm good at software. It would be a little more specific. It could be a soft thing like I'm good at resolving conflict or vision. Just say I'm good at blank. Scribes, please just write down what some of the strengths are. Thumbs up. Yeah, we're Done? Okay. No, the goal is just to come up with some strengths. Okay, we're going to have some discussions in here that will show you the mechanics of a high performing tribe. That's why we're doing this. Okay, third and last question. Now, let me, let me tell you how you can't answer it because somebody was going to yell at me if I didn't. So, what's the question? Why did you decide to come here tonight? Remember what you can't say? It's going to take grief for it tomorrow if I didn't. Why did you decide to come here? That's my question. get in and collect the data on this 24,000 people. Uh, I'm going to skip the, the type of tribe that is so rare, but it goes violent. We didn't do that. This one is really common. The theme, remember, we're measuring language. What people say about themselves, their work, and each other. What they say is, my life sucks. Now, they may not literally say those words. It is the, if you will, the parenthetical of everything that's said. So I'm certain today when the plane was circling over JFK, here's probably what the pilot and the co-pilot were saying. Yeah, those people in Washington, they never get anything done, yeah. How's your coffee doing? That's okay. I gotta go pee, me too, but we gotta circle, oh man. I got a date tonight. Right, I mean, that was probably the discussion. It's usually the discussion of PSAs, the group that screens you before you get on a flight. So you can find this in various pockets. You find this in the place that, that renews driver's license. Right? I mean, you go in there and you wonder how can people be so stupid and yet live, right? So it is not a measurement of the individual talent. That is not it. It is the tribal dynamic. So here's a question. Why is it that when some smart people go to work, they become dumb? This is a dumb tribe. Why is that? So let's watch how that works. So, tr so a little clump right, right here. What was one complaint that came up? Just one. Lack of collaboration. So imagine that we're sitting around with our drinks, whether it's coffee or water, and someone says, you know, 
lack of collaboration just sucks, yeah. It really does. We make eye contact with the floor and we nod, take a sip of our drink. What's another complaint that came up? Not being heard. Yeah, you know, I don't feel heard. Yeah, the other day I was in a meeting and I said something. It's like I hadn't said anything at all. Yeah, it's really bad. Well, let's see, what came up back over here? Pump right here. Um, understaffed and overworked. Yeah, I mean, we're just, we just, people get this done and they want us to be collaborative. Man, it's just, it's really crap, isn't it? Yeah, it is. Let's see, what came up over here? Uh, lack of clarity. What do they want us to do? I don't know. And when I go in and ask for it, they say, well, you just need to step up. What does that mean? What does it mean to step up? Well, you just need to, you know, you just need to get engaged. You just need to get in the game. Because the train is leaving the field. It's just this. And then, I don't it's really stupid. And I don't have resources. And now, if you've got a sarcastic person, I mean, someone who's funny in a tribe where this is how they talk most of the time, maybe all of the time, it's pretty much game over in terms of productivity. So what would happen if this is the way that we talked most of the time and you brought in a team builder? Someone to make us team building stuff. Ah, uh, team building <laughs> I knew the people who run the place are stupid. I know they were that stupid. Wow, <laughs> only they would have taken this money and you know, let me get a new computer. That'd be great. That would have increased productivity or maybe hire a new person, but no. We have to come here and learn to trust one another and love one another. It's crap. So this is 25% of tribes. This is the dominant mode of communication in one in four tribes. Now, so we're going to get to the 7% of where this is going. Stage three, notice I skipped stage one. Stage one is very rare and it goes violent and it causes all sorts of ugly things, but it's so rare. Really. Okay. Stage two, on the other hand, is 25%. That's where people become passive, apathetic, victim. They become like the walking dead. They just they become zombies. Now, stage three, on the other hand, is very different. The theme is, I'm great. This is Donald Trump, to connect some of the dots from earlier. And you're not. I mean, I wish you were great. For you, it would be great if you were great, but you're not because you're, let's see, you, and let's see, who would that make me? Oh, that would make me me, and I'm better than you. Now, how does this come out in the real world? Well, let's see, I'm the manager, and you're not. So sometimes, though, it comes out where a group has decided to be somewhat collaborative in strengths. So watch this. Let's say that somebody in authority steps forward, and they say, okay, how do we really take this group to the next level? Watch what happens. The group in the back with three, used to be six, now you're three. What was one strength that came up? Answer to the second question. Solving problems. Solving problems. And so a hand goes up, notice the dynamic, gets called on. Person says, I think, notice the focus on I mean mine, I think that we just need to be better at problem solving. You look around, don't see if you're listening, so let me elaborate. So now I've said I, now I've said me. So in my view, we have about 13 problems, because when you were blabbing on, I was writing them down. So I think if we just kind of passed out the list and got people focused on problem solving, we could have this done in a good hour. But there's no applause. No one gives you an Academy Award. Instead, other hands go on. What was the strength that came up from the little pump back here? Negotiation. Sorry? Negotiation. Negotiation, brilliant. So the hand goes out. Well, in mean, this lack of clarity, often we don't know. I think we need to be in a better role of negotiating what the outcome is so that we can move ahead with clarity. I think it's about negotiation, about negotiation of roles. I don't know about this problem solving. I think we can all do that in our sleep. I think it's about negotiation. Let's see, what came up the clump right in front of the group here? Breaking down tasks. Breaking down tasks. So, uh, look, I don't even know what we're trying to do here. So just from my perspective, I kind of need to break it down and you know make it clear. <laughs> And I don't know about this negotiation stuff, but I don't even know what we're here to do. What is the purpose of this meeting? Let's kind of break that down. Let's get a little bit more specific. And then the hand goes up in the back. I think you're missing the point. We're here to find new ways to work together, and you missed my point about problem solving. No, you missed my point about negotiation. Welcome to faculty meetings at universities. Discussion <laughs> in law firms. This is how architects talk to each other. I'm a better architect than you. This is how dentists talk to each other. I mean, literally, I'm here in town with, at a big physician conference. This is the conversation at the bar. Well, what kind of medicine do you do? Oh, that must be boring. I'm a plastic surgeon. Oh, you're a plastic surgeon, so in other words, you're not very smart, but you get paid a lot and you like to drive a Ferrari. 
Well, you know, see, what I do is I'm an oncologist, which is both important and I get well paid, right? So you get people actually measuring themselves on this basis. So here's, what, here's the observable part of it. People say, I a lot. The focus is on my perspective, my view, my experience. What would cause people to talk this way? It is the lack of shared values, where we started. So if we have not made some kind of decision making explicit, this is all there is. So you rely on your experience, your time in the field, your success rate, your accomplishments, your perspective, or your skills. Here's how I see it, here's what I'm good at doing, in my view, I've been in this business for 15 years. It's a lot of I, me, my, and people leave feeling very frustrated. The downside of this is it is conversation without end. The number is 49%. So 49% of tribes talk this way most of the time. And there is no ability to do agile well. And you can see how that would come out. Now if you got a manager in the group, well, I'm the manager, you're not, so this is how it's gonna be. Well, I, I thought we were gonna make decisions empirically. I've got data. Well, I've got a lunch commitment, so can we make it quick? And you see how it goes. And people leave feeling frustrated. It is conversation without end. There's no resolution to it. Congress, stage three. Okay, stage four. Now refer to this, yes, please. Yes. I have to do this and I'm gonna get graded on it. So everyone help me to not I like I'll help you if I have time, but I need Right. So a lot of times, yeah, I mean, the way we set up companies, and I'm a management professor among other things, so I'll take the hit on it, is look, we love team and we gotta to work together, collaboration's great, but you're gonna get graded on these six things. So then you've gotta make friends and it turns into like a reality TV show. I'll help you with your stuff if you help me on mine, let's get together and screw those other guys over there. That's the reality of life in companies. That is not reality in the best companies or in the best tribes, okay? So as we start to, you know, to wrap this up, so for, this is actually where we started. People say we, and what they mean by it is their shared values. Now I wanna show you just a quick little summary, uh, a little video of a group that has nothing to do with anybody in here. Uh, I'm in town for healthcare, so this was kind of on my mind while I was making up the slides. I wanna show you just a quick video from a company called Nova. They make walkers. So if you ever lose your mobility and need a walker, let's hope that you get one of these. Here's the only question. When people in this group make decisions, what are the decisions based upon? Okay, here's the quick little Nova video. This is maybe a minute and a half. Her walker tuned up, and our staff had met her several times. I'm like, you've got to meet this amazing woman, Denise. She's a huge Nova Walker fan. So I came out here and met her, and she completely changed my life. She was diagnosed with ALS in her early 40s, and it was like, we're all mobile people, but I remember I was like, oh my gosh, that could be me. You know, I, I could be her. And um, it's robbing her of her mobility, but she still perseveres. And she's kind of like, God damn it, I'm still gonna walk, I'm still gonna do things. I just needed my own, a new set of wheels. And so I was just, even though I'd been in the business for so long selling these products, meeting her made me realize that I'm kind of making these products for someone like me. I think about a person yeah. and how much their lives would be improved by getting one of these versus one of these. I was just going to say, that's not very sexy. Yeah. No. That's not very, what was the word that you used? Not very hot. Not hot. No, I so this is, this is, let me just explain one thing, because I, I get a little, tiny bit emotional here. My dad had gotten a walker the day before. Uh, he has a condition called myasthenia, he's 89 years old. So this kind of hit me sort of hard. I actually didn't even know what this company did um, when I agreed to go, you know, visit them. So just keep, just keep that in mind as we wrap up the video here. It's an upgrade. Because it's so... It's debilitating. It is. Well, you just think about, you know, like from the three laws of performance, how things occur to you. This occurs like I'm old and it screams. I'm old, yeah. I'm sick. I'm old, I'm sick. And it's only going to get worse. Yeah. Yeah. This is as good as it will yeah. ever get. And yeah. this really sucks. Wow. And this has been the industry standard for 48 years. And somebody probably thought it was really cool to put the um, tennis balls on there. Well, those are, so we are on a mission to get rid of those tennis balls. Yeah. And our competitor makes tennis balls to put on the walker. Um, really? And, and so what, what we said is that they do it because the walker doesn't work. That's why. Ah. That's really why they do it because the walker never moved very well. 
And so people thought, okay, I'm going to take a knife and cut tennis balls on the bottom. Right. Horrible. And then now people make fun of it, right? So right. we're on a mission, and we're started with Carson, where no, nobody in the city of Carson has that because everyone in the city of Carson gets free walker skis. So we just thought we'd start with our own city. So we want the dog to say, why is this going on? This is crazy. Why do people right. do that? So that's yeah, he looks like a perplexed dog. I would be perplexed too, yeah. and I am. I mean, why do people do that? So I wanted to end here with this idea that a lot of this value stuff is happy and it makes us excited, it makes us motivated. It should also piss us the hell off, right? That things are not being done in the right way. What ticks them off here is that when people hit a certain age or lose their mobility, they lose their vibrancy. They lose the ability to go walk on a trail. And so they make these things, and they're, it's all about kind of preserving human dignity, right? That's what makes them say this. So just to round out the 7%, only 5% of tribes are stable at stage four. What does that mean? They're supported with triads. They talk actively of, about their values. So even when something comes along, they're not kicked off, OK? What is this from? Brave. Brave. 2% of tribes, this rounds out our discussion, are at stage five. And they say, essentially, life is great. That life is only to be determined by the core values that we have. So we, went, we walked into Pixar a very long time ago and said, who's your competitor? And they said, hair. Hair? Hair? Yeah, we can't render it. It looks stupid. Now, hair is not a value. Well, maybe where I'm from in LA is a value. But normally, hair is not a value. So what is the value that underlies that? Mastery. We didn't know how to master hair. Or you could say artistry or perfection, something like that. And when they finally popped the ability to render hair, they went crazy. They built a whole movie around it. And it was this thing called Brave. OK? So here's been the discussion. Wrap it up, and I'll shut up. First of all, what we need are profits. And I mean that tongue in cheek, but also not. That a prophet is someone who looks back and notices where we've come from, notices what our enduring values are, and then talks in terms of them. That encourages people to make decisions at a tribal level, a tribe being between 20 and 150 people, in common ways. Part of being a prophet is not making every decision alone, whether you've got the formal managerial authority or you're better at empiricism or not. It is connecting people. That's called triads. A, the basic building block of a tribe is a three-person relationship anchored by values. Another thing that Try, that prophets do is they build genius tribes. So you have to know what the goal is. The goal is to get your tribes into that 7% that are stable at stage four or possibly sound that outlandish where they say, we are in competition with hair. This is where the industry making innovation comes from. So hopefully something here has triggered a thought. I really hope you'll take something back. Any just last comments or questions before I shut up? Sorry? Stage four was 22%. Five are stable at stage four. Please. Would you say a, a prophet sees the values we should have and the value of values? Yeah. That's actually well said. And the value of values. That's very well said. Yes? Do you see groups greater than triads? I'm sorry, one more time? Do you see groups greater than three or greater than yes. triads? A triad is the basic building block. So if you add a fourth person, you've now got four potential tribes. And if you do the math, how many potential tribes are there in a group of this size? Very large. But the, the basic, the irreducible element is going to be three people. So you can't have stage five alone on an island. Yeah, I need three. Three people can. But can. Anything else? Well, then let me just say, thank you very much for being here. I absolutely love the work that you do. I think it is revolutionizing you know, so much in the world, and especially in organizations. My goal is it needs to be the operating system by which every decision is made, not just decisions in IT or in information-led companies, but I mean in every organization in the world. That's my personal mission. Very glad that you're here, and I hope that you'll take that on as yours. Uh, Dan, thank you, and I mean, thank you very much for setting this up. Really appreciate the invitation. Thank you. Thank you, Dave.